Most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that you came to set us free, free through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you open our eyes spiritually to what you are doing in this world today. May all of our eyes be open to see your hand at work, all of our ears open to hear your word, and all of our hearts open to receive and embrace it. Holy Spirit, take over this service and kindle in us the fire of your love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. I am sure that most of you are a little bit chilled this morning. I know at 6.30 this morning when I was headed in, it was 37 degrees outside. As you can see, I did not ride today. I drove the truck. God did give me some sort of brain on occasion, but... I didn't bring my leather jacket, and I saw more leather jackets this morning than I've seen in a long time. Today is a day in which we really hear about the message of Jesus. We hear what his mission is. In the past, I'm sure that some of us have thought about his mission was to come and to heal, to come and to show signs. And those were things that happened. The miracles and the signs were there to show others that he truly is the Son of God, not just some other prophet, but that he truly is the Son of God. Because while the prophets of old, Elijah and Elisha and some of the others, were able to perform miracles, they did it because of God's grace. They did it because God gave them the power to do that. But when you look at Jesus, while he does some of the very same miracles that the prophets have done, he has also done miracles that were about creation, about how he created. Just last week we talked about how he created. But think about the other ones where he feeds the 5,000. He had to create that bread. You see, only God can create. And all of this points to him as being the true Son of God, God incarnate, not just some prophet. But here we find his mission statement. When you go on a company's website, don't they always have something like their mission statement? You know, they have something that tells you something good about their company, why they say something, why they're doing it. Their mission is to, and most of those times they're kind of like the mottos that they have. Be all you can be for the army. You know, there's a mission statement in it. But this is Jesus' mission statement. And we might get it confused with Isaiah 61 because we do read the same thing. Jesus is using the words of Isaiah in this passage. Listen to these words. Isaiah 61, starting in the first verse. Let me find it for you here. And if you ever have your Bibles with you, feel free to open them up and follow. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because He has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But one phrase that he doesn't use in part of that is this part. He says, and the day of the vengeance of our God. You see, Jesus didn't come to pour out the vengeance of God. He came here to redeem, to reconcile, and to heal us. He came for us. This is his mission statement. To heal the brokenhearted, those who have been longing for God, those who have been longing to hear His voice, those who have been longing to see Him, those who have been waited for, waiting for Him to enter into the world today to heal their hearts. To say, I'm here. I've never abandoned you nor forsaken, but I'm here now. Rejoice. Rejoice. In our reading from Nehemiah today, you have to take a look at what had happened to Israel. Israel had fallen away from God. The Assyrians had come in. The Babylonians had put them into captivity. And through God's mighty hand, He released them from Babylon. He sent them back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Not at their expense, but at 
the rulers of Babylon's expense. It was placed upon them to send them back and to provide for them. Now, I don't know about you, but wouldn't you like somebody to build you a nice big house and it's all paid for and you just move in? No mortgage payment, no nothing. Wouldn't that be really exciting? Well, think about the Jewish people, the Israelites. They're going back. They're getting all of this paid for. But it's not by the ruler's hands. It's because God had placed on his heart and used him to supply their needs. God can do that. He can use those that are bad to provide for the good. But it's his hand. They must have been excited about it. And Ezra the priest starts reading from the book of Moses. How many of y'all know what the book of Moses is? Okay, we'll start out. It's the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus. Okay, come on, we'll try that again. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And he read it so that they understood. Now, that wasn't meaning that their hearts were blinded. It's meaning because they had lived in different parts of the world or different parts of that area geographically where they didn't know this language. And he expressed it and gave it to them. And they were filled with joy. They were filled with awe. And they weeped because they heard what God had said, what God was doing and the promises of what God was doing. The promises of who he is that he hadn't forsaken them. Jesus goes on from this passage and he says, to hear the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The first thing he does is he gives the credit to where the credit is due that it is the Spirit of the Lord. Remember when he was baptized the father came down and he heard the voice of the father say this is my son in whom I'm well pleased and he anointed him you see we can't do ministry for God unless we're under his anointing it means that he has given us his spirit and empowered us to go out to do his ministry we may do things but we're not doing it under God we're doing it on our own for our own glory but when you do it for the spirit of, in the Spirit of the Lord, when you're empowered, you do it for God's glory. Jesus didn't come for His glory. He came to glorify the Father. And that's what we're called to do. Luke puts this parable right after Jesus comes out of the wilderness. And he said, He went out throughout all of Galilee, and He amazed the people with his teaching. He went into their synagogues and teaching. And that was customary. Paul, when he was in one of the synagogues, the rulers of the synagogue asked him, would you like to say something? They recognized Jesus as a teacher, as a rabbi. They would go through the Torah and they usually had about five or seven people that would read from the Torah. And they would read at least three or four lines. It's the minimum that they were supposed to read. And then they would open up the book of the prophets. And did you notice that Jesus stood up, meaning that they asked him to come and read. They saw who he was. And Jesus stood up and he read from the prophet Isaiah. He found this spot in the book of Isaiah. And then he goes to sit down and that's the way they taught. The teachers would sit down It'd be like me having a little stool here and I'd just sit here like this. I don't think I can do that. I move around too much. But then he taught him, And he said this. And he said that the eyes of the blind are open. Now, I have friends who are blind. We all know people who are blind. And they do great things, don't they? If you're a music fan, you know Stevie Wonder, right? Okay? He plays great. Ray Charles. Boom. He knows how to friend of mine played guitar marvelously and we might say that's a tragedy but think about how they get around and how they're doing the tragedy is not necessarily in the spiritual blindness or the the physical blindness the tragedy is in spiritual blindness because we're looking at us and looking around rather than looking to Jesus and who he is and what he does for us 
The eyes of the blind are open. See what God is doing. God is coming to release the captives. I think that's a really important part for us to understand. Releasing the captives and that we are captive to sin, but we're captive in our own lives. How many of you ever have not felt worthy? I don't want to look. But have you ever felt unworthy to do something? Have you ever felt you're not qualified to do something? Have you ever felt you can't do something? But you see, Jesus is saying to release those that are captive. Being captive is hard, and when we're released from it, we still have some of those feelings. I don't know if you have followed the news lately. 35 years ago on January 20th in 1981, the, those that were held captive, the 53 who were held captive by the Iranians after the assembly, after the embassy had been stormed, were released. They spent 444 days in captivity. They were held as prisoners. And on the 20th of January, 1981, they were released. Just recently, there were five who were released from prison. One of them was a Marine. Spent four years in prison. Another one was a journalist from the Washington Post. And here's what he said. I am humbled by all I learned about the efforts undertaken on my behalf. I was humbled. You see, that's what Jesus does. We should be humbled before him because of all that he did for us. That he came for us to save us, to reconcile us, to redeem us so that we can be in the presence of God the Father. So that God can empower us by His Holy Spirit. Jesus was empowered to do all. But we are empowered when we believe in Him. Not just believe of Him, but in Him. There's a lot of people who believe Jesus, but do they believe in Him and have that relationship with Him? Because then we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Which means we go and minister the same way that he ministered to others. Our reading in Corinthians is so profound to us because sometimes I don't think we realize the power that we have, but I want to tell you that you are entrusted by God. How many of y'all were a little scared when you first drove? Okay, how many of y'all were really scared when you turned the keys of your car over to, you know, someone? Oh, I remember when I gave the keys to my son like, oh Lord. I was on pins and needles the whole time. And then we said, I want to go here? I'm like, Daniel. And he would come home for Christmas and he would drive back and I'm in pins and needles. But you see, when I handed him the keys to the car, I entrusted him with that car. I entrusted him to take care of that vehicle. I entrusted him to follow the laws. I entrusted him to bring it back to me in one piece, not in several. But I entrusted him. And that's what God does. When he gives us his Holy Spirit, when we follow him, he entrusts us to do his ministry on the earth. Anybody can be a philanthropist, but are we doing it for God or are we doing it to show the earth? Jesus never came to glorify Himself. He came to glorify the Father. We come to glorify Him and the Father. But we need that power because sometimes we're held captive. I read an article recently in the Washington Post about the five that were released. And one of the things that they said was that even though they were released and they'd been back on homeland, they still didn't feel free. One person kept losing their keys, or not losing them, but forgetting their keys. And the reason was is that they were, if they were in prison and when they were held hostage, if they touched the keys, they would have been punished. 
because it would have opened the doors to get them out. It was something in their mind. They were still held captive by that. And sometimes we are held captive by our past when Jesus says, I forgive you. And I release you. And then he empowers us to go out and do ministry. Are some called to be apostles? Are all called to be apostles? Are all called to be teachers? Are all called to be evangelists? Are all called? But he entrusts us and empowers us with gifts. And that's the point I want you to take home with you in addition to Jesus came to free us. But he came to empower us. And Paul uses the analogy of the body. I mean, I'm glad I have hands because I can eat. Not that I should eat as much as I do, but I can eat. I'm glad that I have legs and feet because I can walk. I'm glad that I have eyes that I can see. But without all of this, you know, the body is different. It adapts, but it's different. But all of you aren't hands. All of you aren't eyes. All of you aren't feet. All of you, Each one of you has a gift to be used by God. No longer are you held captive, but you're able to use that gift for His glory. To share the good news. Last week we had our annual meeting. And the one thing I've noticed in all of that is that God has really blessed this church. And I see the finances and where they are. I mean, we could be a lot better than we are, but we're good. We are in the black and the positive side this year, which is really good. Our average Sunday attendance runs between 150 and 165 on an average for the year. Do you know what the average is for the Episcopal Church? The average Episcopal Church, the average Sunday attendance? It's gone down from 65 to 60. Last year, they lost 23,000 people who went away. The number of churches that are under 20, average Sunday attendance, increased by 16. And I think there's two reasons why. One is that they're not preaching the gospel. They're not getting out there. They're not sharing the word of God. They're not inviting people and giving them the hope of His grace and love and mercy. Because when we do that, people will be drawn to Him. They don't have a purpose. But God empowers us to do that ministry. To share what He's doing. I asked Darlene if I could have the operatory time when they sing today. Next Sunday, I'm not going to preach during that time, don't worry. Next Sunday, we have Stephen and Mary Doss coming. And there's a video that I want you to see. I tried to show it over there. But during the operatory, I want to show you that video. It may take a little bit more time of your time. But when you see the ministry that they're doing, they're doing a ministry that God's called them to. They're doing a ministry that is life-threatening at times to them because of where they're doing it. But they're getting out and feeding these kids. And Stephen, yesterday at Dyson Convention... He said that these kids stop huffing paint when they come. Not trying to relieve their pain through the drugs and the sniffings and that. But their pain is relieved by Jesus and the touch of Jesus. You see, that's what we're called to. That's what we're empowered to do. Is to go out. None of you are immune to Jesus. I will tell you that right now. He's there. And he's present. He provides the way to the Father. But most of all, too, He provides you with the Holy Spirit. When you believe in Him as Lord and Savior, He provides you with that. 
and He entrusts you, just as you were entrusted with a vehicle from your parents or your grandparents or whoever, and you entrust somebody else. You see, that's what God does. He entrusts us with His ministry. He came to open our eyes so that we could see. He came to release us from the captivity that we were held by sin. And even though you don't feel worthy, He calls you worthy. He calls you righteous. He calls you to share the light to the world of who He is. And to give Him. And give them hope. His grace, His love, and His mercy. Amen. I want to leave you not on a sad note, but on a good note. Because I know Stephen and Mary. And in their conversations with them, there are success stories of those that they have touched and reached and have brought out of that lifestyle. But they wouldn't have if they didn't know them. They wouldn't have if they hadn't been in the streets working with them. We're not all called to that kind of ministry. But we are all called to serve Jesus in some capacity. And that's what I want to encourage you. Spark that gift within you. Don't be afraid because Jesus sets us free to do that. And reach out and touch. I'm so excited about them being here. I'm sorry. I'm just elated. And I want you to be here because they have great stories and they have other stories. And some I won't share with you that he shared with me because I know he wants to share them with you. But be Jesus to somebody. God gave you the keys. Jesus gave you those keys with the power of the Holy Spirit to go into the world and touch lives. And when lives are touched, they can shout to the glory of God. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all persons. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. As I said, when we know Jesus in our heart, when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, and those whose lives have been touched, we can shout to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west. Our going forth song today is Shout to the North. Let us stand and sing Shout to the North. <laughs>